Hello, my name is Joshua Sohn, and it's a pleasure to be here today with you to go over a percussion workshop. Um, also, we'll go over how to create uh, more interesting lines um, with variations and things like that in this lesson today. So, hope you enjoy. Stick around. Okay, so it's important to understand the different categories of percussion. I like to categorize them in three different groups. The first is tune percussion that includes timpani, um, but also all the keyboard instruments like marimba, xylophone, glockenspiel, the chimes, and so on. Um, they all will have a tuned pitch uh, for each note that you strike. The next is non-tune percussion, so any drums or any other percussive instruments that don't really produce a pitch. And the third is sound design percussion. So uh, sound design instruments are basically synthesized or manipulated sources that mimic the colors and elements of an per actual percussion instrument. So as you can see over here on my end, uh, I have some sound libraries that have uh, sound design percussion elements like the hits or let's try this one okay here's another whoosh as you can see a lot of these instruments mimic the sounds of a actual percussion instrument hits are combinations of bass drum and maybe some snare, um, toms, things like that. Whooshes remind me of suspended cymbals that are uh, crescendoing. And um, you have pulses, something like this. I mean, it just sounds like um, smaller um, wooden percussion instruments that are clicking together, things like that. So all of these sound design elements um, can be added as a substitute or just layered on underneath the actual percussion instruments to produce a, a more full or beefier sound. So now that you have non-tuned, tuned, and sound designed elements, it's good to uh, know their ranges of instrument. I have some non-tune and sound design elements together. What I uh, meant to do here is just to show you that uh, there are low percussion sounds, there's mid, and there's high percussion sounds that uh, uh, really work together in that timbre. So um, for instance, low instruments uh, like the bass drum, taiko, um, sound design booms and pulses really work on the low end together. On the mid side, we have snare, toms, doombeck, conga, and bongos, and then the highs are shakers, tambourines, and etc. So for instance, if you look at my screen, I have my timpani up here, drums, uh, low, middle, high instruments, all the sound design stuff, and then below that are my keyboards or key instruments. I will go ahead and just play some of those over here on my end. So for a low instrument, a good bass drum would be um, a non-tuned low instrument. I also have a tuned timpani here. Okay, uh, we have some mallets over here. Okay, and then we have snare drum for mids. Okay, we also have, um, on the high end, I have maybe a tambourine that would work really well. Good. All right, tambourine and triangles. So all of those are nice for the high ends. Um, of course, your crashes and um, gongs and things like that too. Now going to the next slide, what I wanted to do is talk about common techniques and articulations. So as a percussionist, there are different rudiments and, and techniques that we use, but generally as an overall, um, there uh, the three main ones that you'll use are your single hits, flams and drags, and rolls. So your single hits are basically you strike the instrument, but then you let it either ring out 
or you can choke it to make a more staccato feel, or you can you can even strike different parts of the instrument. Like for instance, a conga has um, you know at least three different tones you can produce just uh, by striking it with different parts of your hand and different parts of the head. Um, we also have uh, flams and drags. Flams are um, uh, more it's synonymous with the snare drum. So if I go back to the snare and play um, this, let's see, that's a that's a flam. It's basically two notes playing together at the same time. Okay, you can do that with all sorts of other instruments like timpani. And then the other is going to be your roll. So the last technique here, um, again, I'll just use a snare drum for example. I can roll like this. I can bring the volume up and down and then end it on a button or I can just end it as a really soft. Let me try it again. Um, so it can fade out and uh, without putting a button on it. All right, another thing to talk about are certain percussion instruments that don't have an exact uh, downbeat, so to speak. The one that comes to mind is the suspended cymbal. These notes have a general starting point and a release, and that release uh, can vary on where that downbeat is. So for instance, if I want to hit measure 23, I would probably want to start a little bit beforehand and just depending on how long it triggers. So for instance, if I'm doing this, or if I trigger a different note and do this, I have to time it just right. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna start back here. Again, I'm gonna to try to hit measure 23 on the release. Okay, and I think I got where that downbeat should be. So that is something that would apply to the gong, uh, timpani rolls, um, uh, rolls on the bass drum, um, anything just that has a big indefinite uh, sound that would call it where the uh, downbeat is. You kind of have to uh, finagle that a little bit and get it to the point where it sounds good. Okay, now other things, um, it's important to know the tempo and meter as percussion is the heartbeat of your orchestra, so they really set the tempo um, and the feel. So it's important to know what your meter is going to be. Is it going to be in simple, compound, odd, or mixed? How should it feel in the sense of the tempo and mood? I think it'd be good to demonstrate that by playing you a piece to kind of give you an idea. Okay, so uh, what you just heard was a very solemn feel. Um, it's slow moving. Now you can go to the opposite of that and play something fast, like a fast, quick march, and all of a sudden the mood changes. So not not just with a harmonic progression, you can you can really set the mood just with the uh, tempo and the uh, type of instruments you use. Okay, moving on, we have hits and accents. Um, what I was uh, going for on this slide is just to talk about um, your different types of patterns and textures that you create around certain hits. This example here, I'm designing a, a, a pattern with the snare drum, bass drum, and crash cymbals, and um, there are certain accents that you'll hear. So let me go ahead and play that for you right now. Uh, 
as you'll see, uh, the snare drum was uh, busy, and there's a lot of notes there. But then all of a sudden you have bass drum, and then you have the crash cymbals giving more of the hits that are happening. And this would work really well where um, the strings and the brass also double up on that. What's important about this is you want to emphasize uh, the hits with accents, or like what you've seen before, I layered it with other instruments like the crash cymbal. Next one is uh, tips on writing for percussion. So first tip is to just be familiar with different styles and repertoire. So here are some styles that I would highly recommend you to really get down and get familiar with. The first one is your march and processionals. So again, uh, any of this uh, music examples uh, you may recognize. Um, I will play just a little bit, a snippet from one of those. Okay, um, now the traits are usually in 4-4, it's in four, four. it can be driving or it can be more laid back depending. Um, it's good for action, battle, regal, and fantasy adventure. Alright, we also have waltzes. Waltzes uh, are basically in 3-4 with a strong downbeat on the 1. And then um, if you know any of the uh, waltzes from Johann Strauss, uh, like the blue Danube waltz, uh, that's a perfect example. Okay, and this is great for historical, dance, drama, and romance. Okay, the next uh, style to really master is rock. An example of that is the X-Men First Class theme. Um, also, the soundtrack from Deadpool is great. Uh, I also put a band and artist, Phil Collins, Led Zeppelin, just to be familiar with how those drums are and um, how they uh, revolutionized the drumming um, over the years. So... It doesn't always have to be in 4-4. Four, four. Um, a lot of times rock tracks can be in odd meter, so I will play you a track that I composed that's in 5-4. Alright, and as you can see, uh, this is great for pop music, epic orchestra hybrid, uplifting and action. The fourth style to know is Afro-Cuban and Latin rhythms. So um, any of these scores uh, from Jane the Virgin, Puss in Boots, um, and then these Latin recording artists like Pancho Sanchez, Tito Puente, Hector Lavoe, Aventura, and Antonio Carlos Jobim, uh, all from different parts of Latin America. It's, um, um, it's a treat to listen to. Their uh, rhythms are highly syncopated, and um, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes they're in simple, sometimes they're in compound meters. It's good for comedy, reality TV, dance, energetic, and fun moments. Okay, so the electronic uh, style is also very important as this is very uh, popular right now in, in dramas. Um, a good example is that um, the score from Tenet, Wreck-It Ralph, The Martian, Oblivion, Mr. Robot. I'll play a little snippet from Mr. Robot. Okay, as you can see, they're uh, heavily sound designed, um, and uh, sometimes you can um, 
mix that with real percussion and sound design elements. And this is good for sci-fi, um, post-apocalypse type of themes, dramas, and retro video games. That's a wide range. And then also, speaking of a wide range, this is also another wide range of genres. So seasonal and holiday type of music will have its own type of unique instruments, uh, percussion instruments that are synonymous with the holidays, such as the sleigh bell. Um, I have a sleigh bell right here so you can hear that. And then uh, magic for elements like in Harry Potter and whatnot. Um, a very common magical instrument that conveys magic is the wind chime. And as you can see, it's good for Christmas, magic, fantasy, and horror music. So that's a very wide range of categories as well. So we're on to the next tip for today. Tip on writing for percussion number two. Uh, make sure that higher percussion can play more busy lines compared to lower percussion. Uh, just because of how our ears hear things and um, how... Um, in the mixing phase, if you have too many busy low-end parts, it gets really muddy in the mix. So it's good to uh, be a little more sparse in the lower percussion compared to the higher percussion. Tip three, maintain interest with your lines through um, rhythmic ideas and syncopation. Here's an idea of that. Okay, and variations and fills are also very important to um, master. What I mean by that is um, if I go back to this slide here, you can see that um, this was just copied and pasted over from the previous uh, region. So what maybe I would do here is just change something on the last part to make it sound more interesting. Um, Maybe I would change the, the snare drum line right here and add, like, let's say, a roll. Let's just do that right now. Okay, I just made a variation of the second half. This is what it sounds like. Okay. And then going to another idea, um, contrasting sections. So, uh, for example, um, from that last slide I just showed you, um, from that last demonstration I just showed you, maybe the next part of that section would be something less busy, and I would add maybe a different color. Uh, maybe I would add some tambourine into the mix or triangle after that. Um, if you want to be more creative, um, it might be uh, more exotic instruments that uh, not are not usually in the orchestra, such as claves or guidos, things like that would just change up the the uh, feel and the percussion will be will sound more interesting because of that. Um, and then also adding effects, so meaning um, you can put delays, you could put uh, different reverbs, um, tremolos, you can automate the pan as another idea. You can do a lot of sound manipulation to make it sound uh, very interesting that way. Okay, another tip on writing for percussion is to write more realism through programming your MIDI. Um, and then uh, velocities, your data, and tuning. So uh, there's all sorts of ways to do so. Um, if you looked at this snare drum over here, you'll see that uh, these snare drum parts have um, pretty varied type of velocities, and that's okay to uh, keep like this. But you know, I could mess around with it and mani manipulate it so that it sounds even better. And this goes for really any instrument like strings, brass, woodwinds as well. All right, and uh, tip on writing for percussion number five. Work on the arrangement as best as you can before mixing it down. So um, you always want to have a good balance of lows, mids, and highs for clarity so it's not muddying the mix. 
Um, so, you know, if you have a lot of sound design elements and, and it just there's a lot of build up in the lows, you might have to think about ways to mitigate that. Um, what are you going to do to um, um, clean up that sound? Are you going to get rid of that uh, low hit? Are you going to get rid of that sub hit, that uh, pulse? Whatever it is, um, it, it's uh, those are the things you have to make decisions on before you actually start mixing. All right, and the last subject is really about mixing percussion in general. Um, we had some questions from you guys asking about how to make your percussion sound uh, good and as far as the mix goes. So here are some tips. Um, I would say when you are checking your levels, um, do it both at a loud level in your monitors and a soft level. Um, I say both because uh, sometimes if it, they're loud, you might actually not hear certain elements once um, you bring it down. So I work in uh, TV and um, sometimes when I play the music against the dialogue and the music is already, let's say, negative 12 dB softer um, from your original composition, you'll actually notice that the, um, the low drum instruments don't really pop out as much. And so it, um, I would have to go back into the mix, bring up the level of the bass drum or uh, timpani or whatever it was, and, and try to get those levels to match better. So it's good to do both on that. I also recommend check in your uh, different types of speakers that you have, uh, headphones and mono. Um, pan your low percussion more in the middle and higher percussion towards the off center left. Um, that's really good to do just in general because of how um, the most of the low frequency energy should be centered and if you want to get a very strong uh, sense of uh, pulse, uh, a very strong sense of low end, and and um, things like the hi hats, the shakers, triangles, those can be panned more off center and make it more interesting in your ears. Uh, last thing is to use your EQ and compression to offending individual tracks. Um, uh, one that's very very popular are cymbals and um, any type of uh, like tambourine, any type of metal jingles, um, those really pop out if you start to master your track. So sometimes um, um, to combat the mastering phase, I might actually do a EQ cut on, let's say, 6 kilohertz to uh, 10 kilohertz, something like that, to mitigate um, the uh, mastering part and how mastering sometimes gives it a lift on the highs. So uh, if you bring down some of that individually, then that will help out in the mastering. Okay, so those are my tips on percussion and mixing, how to write uh, more interesting parts, and so on. I hope you found this valuable, and uh, now we are going to um, talk and chat, do some Q&A together. All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, the Q&A portion of this video. So I hope you've uh, gotten a lot out of uh, Josh's video for us. Again, I wanna thank you, Josh, for coming on the channel and uh, and just showing us some of the percussion tricks and uh, just really helping us up our game in general when it comes to the instrument. So, I mean, as a percussionist yourself, um, and you know, you've been doing this for so long, what, uh, I guess I, I, something that came to mind is how do you personally view the percussion section in comparison to maybe like the other sections of the orchestra? Oh, yeah. um, do you use it as a backbone or do you kind of use it as a, uh, as a, as an additional element afterwards, or do you kind of see them all together? What's your kind of approach to that? Yeah. Um, that's actually an interesting question because, um, as a standalone percussion can be, um, its own beast, you know, its own little ensemble, with melody and, and whatnot, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think mo what most people think of percussion in the orchestra setting are like the drums, all the sparkly sounds that come out from the yeah. back, right? And so, yeah, um, I actually wrote some notes here. I, I think it, it'd be good to address that um, uh, just kind of one by one. So mm -hmm. I, I think the role of a percussion in orchestra is to highlight and emphasize certain moments in the music, 
like a mm-hmm. glockenspiel that doubles with strings, or um, sometimes when you're crescendoing, you know, like the uh, timpani rolls and bass drum rolls mm-hmm. with um, mm-hmm. a really big moment in uh, an orchestra. Yeah, all of those things um, um, just in- help enhance. And then another role that's important is to um, help define the groove and unify um, all of the orchestra in a way so that they're sort of like glue it's the glue for the um, orchestra's rhythms so they can mm-hmm, play on mm-hmm. time with each other um, cool. and then also it sometimes certain instruments like um, like an ethnic percussion like a doombeck or like a Chinese gong will take you to a, a different place uh, just by hearing mm-hmm. that and, and so for the mm-hmm. audience you know that is really special and they can uh, hear just like this one different timbre that will um, just uh, t- uh, sweep them to another land. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. And that brings up a good point. I mean, there's like when we're gen- generally talking about percussion, we're thinking about like the Western percussion, but then there's like Eastern and the uh, and and um, yeah, there's just so so many varieties of of uh, percussion instruments, and not to mention the other sessions of the orchestra too. But yeah. um, talking about different like genres of percussion, I guess uh, when you, when you were thinking about more bombastic genres of music like trailer music. Versus mm-hmm. something that's a little bit more lighter, light like uh, like classical music or uh, you know traditional film music or maybe even um, like Broadway music or show tunes that type of thing. How do all those percussion styles compare? Would you say if you kind of had to like sum it up into those different approaches? Yeah. Um, so they they all have you know similar properties, right? But trailer music just has uh, probably by far the most uh, low end in terms mm. of your your uh, beefy drums and things like that. Um, mm. And also the, because of the um, synthesized elements, there are just certain sounds that you can't reproduce with an acoustic instrument. Um, mm. And so, yeah, trailers and uh, just more modern film composing um, um, is, is special in its own right. But then, you know, you compare yeah. that to the John Williams and the James Horner scores, um, that also is, you know, has a special place in most people's hearts, you know, um, right. it, it's just, uh, it, it's to me, it, it's a kind of a, a cross between, um, like old log cabin houses, uh, versus mm. now where we have ho- homes with wood studs on the walls, and drywall, right. you know, right. glass and plastic. It's just like a hybrid of everything, right? Sure. And sure. so um, nowadays, it's it's just uh, you kind of have to learn how to write them all. And um, you know, uh, some people might specialize, and that's great. Uh, but you know, if if you're like uh, me, who is tr- just going from one project to the other. You're going to mm-hmm. just have to learn um, the rope on everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting because uh, mm-hmm. I, I, that's a great analogy, by the way. I feel like, you know, with uh, with human life, you know, adapting to technology, mm-hmm. you know, using better materials to build equipment and homes. And like you said, um, it, it's kind of a, a similar concept when it comes to uh, music making and, and percussion, especially, especially like in the more modern styles like trailers or whatever you can really get away with layering, you know, five, six, seven uh, different kicks together, for example, to, yeah. to really get that beefy low end, you know. And mm-hmm. whereas if you're doing the more classical styles, it feels like you have more in your arsenal, which, uh, you know, you can really discover some unique colors that you maybe didn't know before uh, by really just exploring the different options available in acoustic percussion, right? Yeah. But for trailer stuff, if you use a synthetic element, no one's really going to say, Hey, that sounds out of place because they're already accustomed to a more modern sound, anyway, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, but I guess like when when it comes to creating interesting percussion patterns, because that's that's always something I feel like um, we we struggle with at times is how do we create rhythms that aren't just static? You know, we we hear all the time the one, two, three, four, you know, and the the backbeats, right? But when it comes to actually spicing them up a little bit, um, do you have any tips for us regarding, you know, making patterns that that don't just tire the ears all the time? Yeah, I think it's uh, important to um, think about how you can incorporate uh, silence into your playing. 
Um, I didn't mm-hmm. really mention that in the slide, and I should, probably should have. But I think, yeah, it, there, there's some merit in, you know, taking little breaks uh, here and there where it just, like, the the snare drum just drops out or, you know, the shakers drop out just for, like, two beats and then comes mm-hmm. back in. And, and those little uh, moments where it's missing, like, your, your ears actually pick up on that. And then, mm-hmm. like, it, it just kind of it, it startles your brain for a second. But then it, when it comes back in just the next beat over it, you know, it's just enough time to be like, oh, like, that was actually pretty cool. Yeah. Um, right. And, right. Yeah. Um, so that's actually a, a good trick. You know, like, um, when you listen to The Greatest Showman, uh, there's a lot of drums that just kind of stop midway in a phrase and and it comes back in with a fill and it's just like the coolest thing so um yeah if you can figure out ways to do that um as well as um employing syncopation um you know like just kind of offsetting a a note half uh, for like an eighth note or quarter note over Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. doing stuff like that's really cool um, but yeah, like, you know, rather than copy and pasting everything, maybe with the two bars that you have copied and pasted, like just change something on the mm-hmm. next round and then, you know, leave that. And then maybe you can copy and paste those four bars together and, yeah, you know, yeah. do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And, and that brings up a cool point too. It's like when you are, when you're actually arranging, um, it doesn't really matter what instrument, but there's different approaches to writing those parts. So like you said, you could take a bar, duplicate it, change the second bar slightly, copy those two and copy them again. Or you could even play an entire kick drum pattern for like 16 bars, but change it up along the way and then listen back to that and then be like, okay, I kind of like what I did in bar four there. I like how I put that on the on the end of three, for example. Uh, and then you play your snare drum all the way through and you can you know, adapt to that accordingly and yeah. play like that. So it's more of a linear approach versus a kind of a vertical approach. But I don't know, it just it just came to mind. And um, I, I think I thought of that because you know when we're arranging for you know, other instruments like strings and woodwinds or brass, um, they, they tend to be slightly more melodic instruments in that way. Yeah. So people, especially in those uh, in those areas have, uh, you know, more varying degrees of how to write for those, those parts, whatever feels most natural than to them. But yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, mm-hmm. I guess just like the, the breadth of color we have in, in our palette is, is amazing. And, uh, the fact that we have, you know, e- Eastern drums as well, we haven't really explored them as much as the Western stuff. It just shows that yeah. there's so much more to, to cover. So, um, if there's like a couple, like maybe one or two overall tips, Josh, that you could provide to us to really step up our percussion game and make us feel more confident in arranging for the percussion, what would you say? Uh, I would just say, um, try to, um, explore more of the parts that you write. So like, you know, don't settle for like the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe, you know, once you got you have something down, and and uh, uh, you give yourself a, like a day to um, come back to it, and with fresh ears, um, you might actually hear something else that will conflict. Like a lot of times, the rhythms of your drums um, might actually get in the way of, of of the melody stuff that's happening, or even just the rhythm uh, sections of the strings, brass, woodwinds. Um, they might, they just might not be matching or jiving. So sometimes mm. you just have to go back, dissect what's going on, um, yeah. and, uh, and reevaluate. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, try to develop your pieces more and, uh, and give some time to really spend, uh, time to get your, uh, percussion to sound as good as possible um, you know, adding variations, those fills, um, everything I talked about before really help with that. Um, sometimes though, what we'll do is we overthink and we just start to over, uh, ver- um, over variation or we, we make right, right, right. too many variations <laughs> is what I'm sure, trying to say. Sure, sure. So, sure, yeah, yeah. So, you know, sometimes then, uh, you know, take a step back and just try to see the bigger picture and, and go from there. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's a great point. And, uh, that I think when you said that, um, I was thinking of, some, oh yes. Uh, try, try to monitor also your existing production on different uh, systems as well. Cause I found that I think it was two weeks ago I was working on a project. Um, and I had, I had this basic pattern. I, I liked it, you know, mm-hmm. but I, I took out my headphones and for some reason I accidentally hit the space bar and it started playing. Yeah. And then, 
the percussion suddenly didn't sound as punchy to me. And I was like, wait, I think my headphones are tricking me. So then I ended up going in, taking uh, a drum sample from Prism uh-huh. and uh, layering that underneath. And it suddenly like beefed it up like 10 times. Oh. And then I put the headphones back in and it sounded so much better. So that, that's one of those happy accidents is like, um, don't be afraid, even if it's not mixed yet, but like, yeah, try to sure. listen on different systems when possible, whether that's on your phone or through the computer or through your headphones or whatever. You might hear things that like suddenly just come up that you haven't heard before. I don't know. Do, do you ever experience that? Oh, yeah. So um, um, when I was uh, making that video, I, I did mention um, briefly that uh, I like I, I mix for TV. And so like we do a lot of underscore. Yeah. And what happens is, um, you know, we create this like beautiful piece and, and you uh, realize that the piece has to be like negative uh, 12 dBs quieter than mm. how you, what you're normally used to. And yeah. then you put that under the dialogue and all of a sudden uh, a lot of the lows just drop out. Uh. Yeah. So then like uh, it just sounds kind of weak and wimpy all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. So then you have to kind of um, bump up some of the lows uh more just so that it balances out and actually um supports the dialogue better so yeah yeah i agree uh listening uh different monitor levels you know soft and loud uh right as well as the different um speakers and headphones right really important yeah that's awesome yeah yeah so i mean Whenever possible, we want to try to get it right in the arrangement orchestration process. Um, we don't want to be spending a whole ton of time mixing and uh, you know tweaking every little knob, right? So we want to we want yeah. to get that foundation laid as good as possible, mm-hmm. and uh, that's definitely something you uh, you've shared with us, um, especially in the video. So thank you so much again, Josh. Really appreciate it. And hey, if yeah, if you guys pleasure. watching found it really valuable, which I hope you did. So I did definitely did too. Um, please let us know and uh, subscribe to Josh. His channel is in the description box below. And if you want to see more content like this, let us know. Um, you know, we could definitely do some sort of like follow up and, uh, and explore more into the world of percussion. Cause it's something that I definitely am not the strongest at. I'm, I'm trying to learn more about it all the time, but it's really nice to have a percussionist himself give us some insight into writing for the section. So yeah, thanks for coming, Josh. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Awesome. All right. See everybody. Bye. See ya.